Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we'll be talking with Dirk Bondi, a lecturer at California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, and the University of California at Los Angeles about post-tension concrete. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. And I am your co-host, Rachel Holland. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Dirk. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S.com. Uh, Welcome to the show, Dirk. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do on the daily? Sure. I am a uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo grad, 1988, and UC Berkeley, 1989 master's. Uh, I worked for seven years for Engelkirk's office, where I got all my licensing done and learned a lot about a lot of things. And in 1998, I started Seneca Structural Engineering. Uh, a year later, I hired my friend and someone out of Inglekirk's, Brian Allred, and the two of us have been, uh, actually since 1998, the only employees of Seneca Structural Engineering. So we're both, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say we don't work well with others, but um, we're kind of control freaks. So we do everything. We you know, start the meetings, do the schematic design. We both do the drafting. AutoCAD, Revit, we both do the engineering. I write all of our in-house software programs. Uh, in the slow periods in 2009 to 11, we wrote the book because we needed something to do. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's hard to say what a life, a day in the life is because it could be anything. We have to handle whatever comes up, but we'll take a job from the first day of hearing about it all the way to the last day of construction all the way through. And it's just just one of the two of us. So yesterday I was tromping around in the mud out in Irvine at a project. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm in that area. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I know uh, I told you this before. I know we met a couple of times at the conferences, but yeah, uh, we'll talk about the book later. But for me, that's something that I deal with on an everyday basis, a lot of post-tension design. So for anyone that does post-tension concrete, uh, definitely recommend Dirk's book if you if you don't know or know it already thank you uh, but for yeah for but for our listeners that aren't familiar with post tension concrete dirk can you tell us a little bit about what post tension concrete is it's a it's a specialized very small slice of structural engineering and it's a small slice of concrete design but it's really becoming very large as you know uh matthew the post tension concrete is a way of reinforcing concrete whereas Rebar is just a passive element that just sits in the concrete waiting for something to happen that, you know, most of us cross our fingers and hope never happens. We never get anywhere near the loads that we designed for, certainly not the factored loads. In post-tension concrete, we take these high strength cables and tension them. We actually put tremendous force in the building on the very first day of its life, actually probably on the third day of the concrete's life. We use high strength early concrete and each tendon will have about 28,000 pounds in it. And it's not unusual to have 25 tendons grouped up. And I'm I'm telling you, Matthew, and I know you know all these things. Uh, your firm does, does a lot of this too. But that tremendous amount of force, you know, it, it's kind of the antithesis of what we think we do as engineers. We don't want to put force in buildings. We 
we want to put strength in buildings and resist force. So post-tension concrete is a very unique and different mental state of design. But because of that, because we put these large forces in, we can actually lift the concrete, whereas concrete wants to sag. Concrete wants to sag, and then it wants to creep over time. So we can offset that, and we can also squeeze it. So we get a lot of crack control. We're not crack free, but we can really diminish the amount of cracks in a building, flatten the floors. And since we're actively using reinforcement that that's doing about 80% of its capacity every day of its life, that leads us to be, being able to use a lot less concrete and other reinforcing. So it's a very efficient system. For instance, you know, our hotels that we'll do will span 26, 28 feet and be seven inches of concrete. And that's the entire structural depth. No other material can, can put its entire structure within seven inches or the eight inches that we can. Wood can't, structural steel can't, nothing else can be that thin and that efficient. So, you know, after the world got past being totally afraid of putting these large forces into buildings, they've really come around and now it's remarkably popular and almost too many people are giving it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's uh, when I was, before I became an engineer, just looking at some of those parking structures and just seeing how thin some of those slabs were, it was a uh, that was something I've always wondered. But then when I got into school, I was like, oh, I get it. That's that's pretty much using uh, engineering hacks to uh, <laughs> to get the most out of concrete. So yeah, it was really interesting, and it's great to be uh, using it today. That's how I feel. I was going to um, jump back to your book. So as you mentioned, you co-authored that book um, with your partner, uh, The Post-Tension Concrete Principles and Practice. Can you talk a little bit about what the book is about and um, how it can specifically help engineers in their projects? Sure. Um, we wrote the book in those, those three down years of, of serious recession. So we got to really focus on it and take our mind off not having anything to do. Uh, but I wrote the book first. The first half of the book are the notes that I was using at UCLA and Cal Poly to teach the class. And, you know, to be very honest with you, T.Y. Lin's book came out in the, I think, in the 60s. And most people, including me, when I was at Cal Poly in the 80s and at Berkeley, were still using that same book. And it's it's a terrific book. But we wanted one that was a little more up to date and a little bit more specific to practicing engineers. But the first half of the book, I put the notes in and I thought, OK, educators across the country would want to put on ticker tape parades for this book and think it was so great and, and all rush to use it. That never happened. To this day, that's never happened. The, the educational community, the university community really I don't want to say shun the book, but, um, you know, I really thought it would be for the university community and they would appreciate it. Again, that that to this day has never happened. The second half of the book were practical examples for engineers who are already out in practice. They weren't in the educational system. They were working at a company and maybe they hadn't had this class or they wanted to see a, a design practitioner's approach. And, you know, I'm sure as, as both of you know, every engineer has got their own way of doing things. And there's only so much that can really be covered in textbooks. But these were design examples. We just put in real life design examples. And those have been tremendously popular, along with the pictures that we just put in the book of our own of our own projects. And we have sold many, many books, but almost entirely to the practicing engineering community. Uh, we're, we're having a tough time getting university professors to want to use the book. They they want to teach pre-stressed concrete from almost the precast perspective. It's substantially easier to do that. They're usually, well, they're precast members. They're simply supported. They have straight tendons. They miss out on all the fun stuff that's part of cast in place post-tension concrete, which is draping the tendons, the continuity, the secondary effects, all the, all the things that make post-tension concrete fun don't show up in precast concrete. So that's what the book is. Like I said, it's been very successful. 
from a practitioner's perspective and probably a miserable failure as a university textbook. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that, that is interesting because yeah, as a pr practicing engineer, uh, definitely been, been valuable to me and my colleagues at work. Uh, and uh, yeah, really going over the practical examples, the the field issues that you'll see that's not covered in any textbook. And uh, it's, it's been a, uh, it's been invaluable and I uh, couldn't recommend it enough to the practicing engineer at least. And uh, I wanted to get into some of the, for some that aren't too familiar with, with post-tension concrete, can you go over some of the benefits, but also some of the things that you have to watch out for with, with post-tension concrete, Dirk? Sure. And that's a fun part of the book is putting in the, the things that go wrong <laughs> when you're putting in six, 700,000 pounds, you know, the equivalent of a pretty well-loaded column into a building, uh, or kit, you know, six, 700 kips, thousands of pounds, uh, things can go wrong. And if it's not taken with tremendous respect, things will go wrong, uh, including vibrating concrete, getting that concrete. You know, let me back up. Most people want that tendon stressed in about three days. One of the beauties and benefits of post-tension concrete is we'll pour concrete on Thursday. On Monday, the crews will come and stress that concrete. So these very large forces are placed in there um, on the third or fourth day. And then the, the forms are stripped and the, the concrete is completely capable of holding itself up at that very early stage of its life. But that's green concrete, that's young concrete. And you have to be careful with young concrete if you wanna move that fast with it. Uh, it can explode literally with rock pockets or honeycombs or, or poorly vibrated concrete or just poor concrete in the first place. The tendons will sniff that out and, and find it and explode it really. Um, you don't have to be doing that many post-tension concrete projects until you will see something going wrong. So we have, Tremendous respect for the anchorage of the concrete, the confinement of the concrete. We now use stud rails for confinement, and we're, that's proving to be much better than the little hairpins that we were putting in. So, so things can go wrong. For the most part, they go right. It just takes a lot of respect. You, you don't want the plumber penetrating and putting penetrations right in front of the anchor. The anchor will move and literally explode right into that that sleeve. Uh, so there, there are things that we are looking out for that that others wouldn't necessarily be focused on. And that's that is a big part of the book and a big part of the construction parts of the book that we tell people to look out for. You can also overbalance. And you know, when you're playing, you know, most engineers feel like more is better. And that's the more cowbell in my in my videos. You know, it seems like if, if an 18 by uh, 35 is good, a 21 by 44 has just got to be better. In steel, that's probably a true statement. 15 tendons in post-tension concrete, good. 20 tendons may cause you to explode the building or overbalance the building or literally shoot concrete up into the air by having too much drape and too much force. So those things happen and we have to be careful. In post-tension concrete, we don't want to air too little or too much. We want to be right. And that that's a frightening thing for engineers because it's nice to know you can always keep building in conservatism when you are an engineer. In post-tensioning, there isn't such a thing. There's just kind of right. And you you really have to hover right in the zone of what's necessary. Yeah, when teaching new engineers, that's one of the things. It's like, yeah, you, you can't just keep putting more tendons in. It's that's this thing that you can't you can't yeah like you're saying you can't just keep putting more in it's it's that's one of the things with the post tension concrete that you have to um, watch out for and uh, but besides that uh, I know the savings in concrete and even the reinforcing steel I, I remember seeing some pictures in your book where you can kind of compare a mild reinforced slab to a post tension slab yeah lots of savings in steel it's you can definitely see it. Yeah, when you go out to a mildly reinforced slab, you can walk all over the top rebar from any place in the building. In post-tension concrete, there's almost nothing to walk on. Uh, there's You walk on the forms for the most part. I love how like uh, 
you have so much experience in this topic, right? I think that's great. And your ability to share that with like the upcoming generation of engineers. Uh, you you teach at both Cal Poly and UCLA. Uh, can you can you kind of comment on um, how you sort of do two universities at once and why you continue to teach um, the PT concrete at both? Well, it's interesting. My father taught the pre-stress concrete class at UCLA in the late 80s and 90s. Um, other people came along and tried to teach it. And unfortunately, because of that, uh, it became an unpopular class because if it really is a class that needs to be taught by somebody who has really delved into it, has does it for a living, has spent a lot of hours racking their brains trying to understand how this works. So in 2011, John Wallace from UCLA came to me, and and again, that was kind of the end of that that really slow recession period, where I was looking for things to do, and he asked if I would teach the class. And I thought I'd been asked before, and I'd always said no because I'm I'm about an hour and a half south of UCLA, but I decided I would take it on. I didn't realize when he asked me at the time that it would be the last time UCLA planned on offering that course ever. Uh, and so it was about the seventh week that I ran into him in the hall and he said, you know, thanks for doing this. Students seem to be happy. If we're ever going to teach it again, we'll call you. And I was devastated. You know, I, I thought I was signing up for, you know, a run to do this. And uh, but then the reviews came back from the students and they mad scrambled and brought the class back the next year in 2012. And uh, I know I'd been canceled because all my contract stuff was gone. They had obliterated me from the system. So I think I worked the first four <laughs> weeks without even officially being hired. But I came back in 2012 and I've been teaching there ever since. That that class has grown. At one point, I had 50 people in the class. And that was a class that started off just trying to have anybody who could sign up for it, you know. I was only getting people who needed three units before they graduated and had to take anything. And then to make the story longer, in about 2014, I was at a fundraiser at Cal Poly and a, a very famous engineer by the name of Florian Barth with BFL at the time, uh, his son was going to Cal Poly in the graduate program. And Cal Poly had canceled pre-stressed concrete two or three years prior to that. So they, they didn't offer it anymore. And, the, and Florian was upset that his son was going to graduate with a master's degree from Cal Poly when, without ever taking pre-stressed concrete. And Florian you know, was the Northern California guru of post-tension concrete. My father was probably considered the Southern California engineering guru and, you know, back, back in the day. Um, so I just happened to be standing there and I blurted out that I would teach his son how to teach it, how to do pre-stressed concrete. And Al Estes, the department head, was standing there and said, OK, um, if you're really interested, you know, I didn't know what I was saying. It just it was like an out of body experience. I'm listening to myself say that I'll do these things. So I ended up using the videos that UCLA had taped. I flew my plane up and met with not just Florian's son, but seven other students decided that if it was a good idea for him to take it and he wanted his father, who was famous and wealthy, also the biggest uh, contributor to Cal Poly's ARC -E program there's ever been, they decided they would also like to take the class. So I taught it. I taught it for free. Uh, the school didn't teach me or, or pay me, uh, but I flew up there every Friday and I enjoyed meeting the students. We didn't even have a classroom. So we'd meet at the lawn, Dexter lawn. We'd meet in the grad lab. We'd meet wherever we could. Uh, and this it really went well. And this was before Zoom, what we're doing right now. And I was told that could never work. Students could never watch videos and learn or learn online and have these discussions. It had to be inside the brick and mortar building, standing in front of them, or they were incapable of learning anything. And it turned out just not to be true. My Cal Poly students were learning it as well or better than the UCLA students. And I asked them, well, how, how come that is? And they said, well, we can watch the video two or three times. We can back it up. We can uh, pause it and, and read what you're talking about. So I realized at that point that there are some real benefits to pre-taped lectures or lecturing you know, online. And, and 
again, since 2014, I have been teaching at, at Cal Poly also the same class. And at some point, I just merged them both into this, the spring quarter and teach them same exact homework assignments, same exact project, same exact lecture videos. And I am really fortunate that I get some of the best students, the best engineering minds that California or Western United States has between those two schools. And, you know, it keeps an old guy like me who's, you know, it's easy to start losing some of your pistons uh, in your brain. You know, I'm, I am maybe operating off of two of them. And these students are so smart. You know, they've taken all of the calculus. They are just on top of their game like they never will be again. And I have to stand toe to toe with all of them. And I'll have between the two schools about 60 students. And that can be terrifying. It can be really terrifying to be live standing in front of them. So I do it as much as I can and, and really let them take shots at me. <laughs> so far, love, I'm still standing. I love that you did it on Dexter Lawn with like not even like a, a real teaching like paid position yet. That's that's so awesome. I think it's a uh, the biggest alumni donation they could ask for, right? Like <laughs> Like sharing all of that with those students. That's awesome. Thank you. I love those students. I love the UCLA students and the Cal Poly students. And they're, they're such different communities. They're different mindsets. You know, every Cal Poly student calls me Dirk because they call all of their professors by their first name. Every student at UCLA calls me Professor Bondi. Even if I were to ask them to call me Dirk, they would call me Professor Bondi. It's just that's the mindset between the two schools. And but they're both great. The students are all great. And they're so smart. <laughs> yeah, that's that was really interesting to hear the the backstory behind those. And uh, I believe your YouTube channel with some of the, your lectures is still up, right? The lectures that were taped in at UCLA are still up there. If you have time, I'll tell you a small story there, and you can just edit this out if you'd like. But um, UCLA through Bruincast taped my lectures and. They, they taped everybody's lectures who wanted them taped. And there was a benefit because your students wouldn't have to show up live. They could, the next morning, those videos would be made available and they could watch. So if they had a conflict or they had an interview or they were just exhausted, uh, they could either watch it or rewatch it the next day. So there were some real benefits. But at UCLA, you got the option to say that I want this available to only my class or I want this available to the world. Could anybody just click on Bruin link and go through the list of classes. And, you know, Harvard was doing this. I think MIT was doing this. A lot of schools back in about 2015 were just making courses available to anybody with an internet connection. I was watching philosophy courses at, at Harvard, I think, just for fun. You know, and I thought, what a great idea to be able to just broadcast to anybody interested. You know, you're not giving them a degree, so they're not and graduate with a certificate, but they are getting the information. I always thought that was important that everybody should have access to the same information. Then a very strange thing happened. There was a lawsuit brought against, I believe, both Harvard and MIT, supposedly by a group of attorneys representing the hearing impaired. And they said it was unfair to give out free <laughs> videos because if they weren't closed captioned, if, if it wasn't equal for everybody. Um, I personally doubt there was ever a hearing impaired person who ever had anything to do with that lawsuit. I think it was attorneys who knew that there were tremendous endowment money that they could have access to. That's my personal opinion. But anyway, so Bruin Cash shut down, everything Harvard was doing shut down, MIT shut down, and you now no longer can go on and watch these terrific courses that, that they had just decided to make available. So I was upset about that. I bought my videos from UCLA and I put them on YouTube because I really believed in the concept and, and I didn't think anybody was going to sue me personally. <laughs> they, I don't have an endowment fund like, uh, like Harvard has. So was it, was there an option to just add the closed captioning or is that, um, Really, just because of the lawsuit, everybody, Bruin, you know, it was a UCLA decision to just shut it down. Right. I didn't have any say. Uh, I think all the universities in the country just decided to shut it down, which is, to this day, an incredibly sad statement because 
you know, the, the approach was right. They were going to make courses available to anybody who wanted to watch them. And I'm a big fan of that. So, so anyway, YouTube is there and I put my videos on YouTube and I, I, YouTube sent me something. I've got over 10,000 subscribers now and I've never advertised it in my life. Um, the only people who ever technically knew about it were my own students who were watching it, but word spreads. And, you know, I, I get these wonderful messages from people all over the world who, um, didn't have access to a university, didn't have money, um, but they're able to watch the video. So I think that's, that's great. And uh, that's, that's unfortunate about the the free education, but you know, at least you still put your, your stamp on there. Uh, I know we got a couple minutes left, Dirk. So I just wanted to end it off with a couple of few more questions, but sure. I, I was really interested in, uh, kind of going off the topic of education what do you think about the current state of state of education related to structural engineering and do you think the industry educational industry should uh i guess how can they improve uh this is where i get myself in trouble funny thing about you know the the uh, covid years were i'm a lecturer at these universities so i usually am not even invited to any of the staff meetings the faculty meetings but because of zoom they sent out a link to everybody and i got to listen in my approach is very different i think than the average professors you know they're always looking for the new and exciting and fun and sexy way of presenting something usually in new software uh, and they're very quick to get rid of the fundamentals, in my opinion. At, and this this really is at both schools that I've taught at. Uh, they they wanted to get rid of pre-stressed concrete. It just wasn't interesting enough. And they want to replace it with more high-tech, three-dimensional modeling type things. And um, so I disagree with that. I, I, I see schools, you know, I, I can understand from the perspective professor perspective that they want to teach what's really exciting to them and what they're doing research on. And, but, you know, we as engineers haven't really changed much about the physics and the way we do buildings since the Roman times. And what we do change is how we present it. So when I was at Cal Poly in the eighties, we were hand drawing with pencil and then it was a big deal to go to pen on mylar. And when I got out to work, this AutoCAD thing was coming along and new and crazy that was never going to take off. And I heard that from all the draftsmen who were hand draftsmen. And of course, they ended up uh, getting replaced by young people. And now we're going through that with Revit. And, you know, Brian and I are learning Revit as fast as we can here uh, because we understand we got to keep up. But um, those are ways of presenting the same thing. But an eight-inch post-tension slab goes just as far and holds up the same amount of load as it did in the 50s or 60s. Um, an 18 by 35 steel beam goes just as far as it ever did and deflects the same and holds up the same amount of load. We really are just trying to find new different ways of presenting it and three-dimensionally and finite elements. And those are all very exciting, challenging things from a software type perspective, but, but we haven't really changed the building, I mean, you can't drive by a building and tell if that was hand-drawn or done in AutoCAD or or done by Revit. So my, I really believe the university systems need to back themselves up and keep teaching the fundamentals, the absolute basics, and let the industry teach the young people what the latest and greatest way of presenting that information is. But you're never going to understand what the complicated computer program is doing if you don't understand the fundamentals and the basics of the physics, the foundational tools that you need. And so that's my my personal opinion is that we're we're launching ahead a little too fast in the educational system and the university system. And the university should be fundamentals and practicing industry should be the application of those principles in whatever medium that is. It's an, it's an interesting yeah. perspective. Um, I, I'm going to um, ask you one final question for this podcast, and I think you probably get asked it a lot based on your um, constant interaction with young people these days. But uh, if you had sort of like a final piece of career advice for um, 
a younger, uh, greener engineer, either like working, uh, starting, starting their career, or maybe just a couple years into their career, what would be your, um, your advice to them? My advice to them, I've got a lot of advice. And that's one of my favorite things about teaching is I will launch off and go on some tangent about all my advice and then forget that run out of time in class. But um, first of all, go to a firm that can teach you everything. You know, go to one of the larger firms to start off with. I know some of the better offers come from the smaller specialized firms like mine. Um, you probably get more money out of school doing that. But but there's a downside. I, I took my lowest paying offer to go to Engelkirk's office, but I got such a rich, wonderful experience learning all the different materials, all about seismic design, large buildings, small buildings. And I got to learn from some of the best in a, in a large pool of people that I could go ask questions of. Um, I just, I, I would never, you know, that was my father's advice. I was going to go for more money. I wasn't going to get a master's degree, but he set me straight on all that stuff. And, and that was great advice. And so I would just give that same advice to the young people. You really want to get licensed. And just like Matthew just got his structural license. Those are, those are your early goals. Those not money, not specializing, um, learn as much as you can and pass those exams. Because once you become a licensed structural engineer, then your options, just all these doors, you're not even aware of. You know, these avenues that you've never heard of become available to you. Um, so that's where I would go. And also, I ask, I beg all my students of this, write your own software. Teach whenever you can, even in the smallest, even if there's an architect who needs to learn something to take their exam. They have to know a little bit about statics and a little bit about design. Teach an architect. I actually started with that. You know, if you've got a local school, I was teaching at Cal Poly Pomona in the 90s, and it actually helped me pass my exams. But that's that's how you stay sharp. If you have to teach somebody else, you will learn the topic so much better than just casually reading about it and, and deciding that you you think you know about it. Um, and write software. You, you When you write software, it's the most challenging, frustrating, and rewarding thing all at the same time. You have to think of every possibility that somebody is going to try to come up with and make your software work for all of those conditions. So you really have to think deeply about what it is that you're writing. And if you can do those things, and also one final thing, hand check. If you're using a sophisticated program, that's wonderful. Do something to hand check and verify that program. Um, even if you're just doing simple statics types calcs and, and tributary areas and making sure that the load that you input is the load that it's seeing. Do all of those things. So keep your mind sharp because... Unfortunately, I sound like an old man, but but companies, whereas they used to have to really invest in the individual because we didn't have, we only had three computers at my 45 engineering firm at Engelkirk's when I started in 1989, two PCs and a Mac. And you had to stand in line and decide if it made more sense to use the computer, or just go back to your desk and do it by hand. Um but because of the software sophistication, maintenance uh, programs, I think some companies are investing more in the software and the computers than they are in the individual. So you are going to have to be responsible for keeping yourself technically sharp. Whereas I do believe back in my day, they would keep us technically sharp. We had lunchtime seminars. We went and watched other SEOC presentations at the dinner meetings, and we kept up to speed technically. I I don't know that that's happening to the same extent anymore for some companies. And so just be personally responsible for your own technical competence. Thank you so much for that great advice, Dirk, and apologies for the abrupt ending. We had some technical difficulties on our part. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There will be a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 97, as well as links to Dirk's book and his YouTube channel, and of course, any other resources and websites that we mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in 
in all of your structural engineering endeavors.